Hello folks, how's everybody? I hope you're doing fine and Happy New Year in advance, okay? Especially to the uh, people who support this program. I want to thank them for supporting it this year. <clears throat> um, not everybody agrees with what everybody what I say <laughs> with all the theories I propose, but one thing I can guarantee you come here by you know, through the grapevine or whichever way you found about this site, I'm going to give you a run for your money. In other words, I'm going to give you a different theory, a different explanation for things. I, I always say that I'm not human. And I'm not human because I don't think like any other human out there. I don't know what people have in their minds. But, yeah, I have a different way of thinking. And so, again, if you come into the site, you may not agree with what I say, but you're going to be entertained to a... Uh, a new way of looking at the universe, okay? And one of those subjects is the subject of extinction. I haven't exhausted extinction by by no no means, obviously, by the questions and the comments that I get, but uh, I don't want to exhaust <laughs> the visitors, right, the viewers. So uh, today's my last installment on this series. Next week, or next time I'm going to end... Uh, with Ayn Rand, uh, there was one episode I did not cover, and uh, I'm going to go over that just before I finish with Ayn Rand as well. And then we're going to get back into what this channel is mostly about, which is physics and what a lot of people usually come to the site for. Okay, But today it's an ex another extinction day, so if you've got something better to do, well, don't do it. Okay. Stick around, you might learn something, okay? So here it goes. Let's start with the comments, okay? We had a comment here uh, by one fellow. He says, And man became the God that he had created, and with his miracles did rule over all the earth. Hallelujah and amen and all that good stuff, you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think he hit it pretty much on the nose when we... We don't even think we're animals anymore. A lot of people don't uh, out there. They think uh, somehow we belong to some other kingdom, rocks and minerals or vegetables. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, we we become the rulers of the planet and forgot that we are not the gardeners. God did not designate us as the gardeners of Eden. We are just another little animal in, in there. <laughs> okay, that's my take on that one. And... Um, so getting back to extinction, here's a comment that uh, some people make. And I said that when the economy totally collapses, by which I mean money is no more and trade has died. That's what I mean when I say the economy collapses. I'm not talking about a uh, temporary depression or recession. I'm talking about total destruction of money. We don't use money anymore. We have no need or not need, but money has no purpose. Okay, especially to pay salaries, which means no one has anything to spend and money does not get cir uh, uh, circled around. And uh, so I said no one will have an incentive to produce food because of that. And that's the key issue for my extinction theory. I'm saying that we're going to die because we're not, we cannot avoid the same thing that claimed the lives of past animals that became extinct. Okay. And so someone put, the incentive is wanting to live. Another one said, money is hardly the strongest motivation to produce food. Well, these people are uh, actually, I think uh, they're focusing on the wrong issue. The issue is not whether you want to live, and the issue is not whether money is a good motivation for you. I'm talking about corporations here. Corporations, they have no interest in wanting you to live or be healthy or anything like that. Corporations are only interested in profits. That's called money. Okay, And uh, so uh, money is hardly the strongest motivation. It's the only motivation. Sorry. You know, uh, we're not talking about the individual here. We're talking about corporations, the one who the people, the the things or the entities that run the the planet. Okay, those are known as corporations. Individuals, little individuals, the little guy there that does his thing on the streets. He's not running the world. The world is run by corporations. Make no mistake about that. Okay, 
Uh, and someone says, even if we stop harvesting the land and animals, we can make food to live on by technology. And I think, I don't know if it's the same guy, said food can be made from coal and high voltage. Yeah, uh, uh, that's in a lab setting. You cannot manufacture food in your garage, especially not at the last moment when suddenly food stops being provided uh, to the uh, cities. And so, no, no, forget about uh, producing food artificially. Uh, that's, that's okay to do it in a lab and say, look, we were able to produce this thing that is edible and we were able to get some carbon and some hydrogen together and make this thing. Those are special situations. We're not going to produce food chemically in the future. We're going to do it the way, we, the old fashioned way, the way we always did it. And that's growing it in the field and uh, with animals and so on. It's like saying we can create an animal, you know, uh, especially to feed 8 billion people. It's not going to happen. These people are dreaming, okay? And again, uh, I think a lot of people just are floating in air. They, they don't have their feet on the ground anymore. Um, here's another comment along the same lines, uh, as far as I'm concerned. It says, it only takes a few humans to repopulate. So they're saying, even if there is a crash and a lot of people die, I don't know, half the population, three quarters of the population, someone will survive and will uh, reproduce, will repopulate the earth again, okay? Next guy says about the same thing, worst case scenario, population grows to 10 billion, three-fourths of the earth's population dies. Eventually the remaining humans will start all over. They're thinking of this Adam and Eve type thing, okay? And in fact, he says uh, they're going to be have an advantage because they're going to have all this previous knowledge, right? And, um, and so they're going to be better off. And he puts a comment, zero population growth does not mean we can't have any more babies, but we choose to have fewer babies. It's not an issue of choice. M women don't have choice to have babies anymore. Okay? Get it through your thick skull. Women don't have choice. Okay, did you hear me? Women don't have choice. Why don't they have choice? Because we move from the country to the city. There is no room in the cities for babies. You can have one baby, two babies, that's it. You're not going to have 10 babies like in the 19th or 18th centuries when people lived in the farms. That, that era is over. The baby era is over. Okay? We consider the baby boom what happened after World War II, and that was just a little drop. Baby boom, no more boom. Okay? And that's because we moved to the cities. When people move to the cities, it doesn't matter if they're black, yellow, white. They won't have any more babies. Women will not have babies. And it becomes also part of the culture where people say, well, I'm not going to have a baby. A lot of women today will tell you straight, straight in your face, uh, they, they're not, they think it's an animal thing. <laughs> Having babies, well, what do, you, what do you think I am, an animal? <laughs> So, uh, no, no more babies. That's never going to happen again. Okay, The era of babies is over. And so, yeah, we're not going to repopulate the planet. And one of the reasons is here. Uh, let's assume um, someone survives on the planet. Well, for them to survive in different regions, in these pockets, uh, that means that everybody died around them. It can't be in any other way. You're not going to have thousands of people surviving in the same region because they're just going to kill themselves if there's no food. Okay, so if there's a family, because I can't even imagine a, a, a group of uh, strangers surviving, they're going to kill each other, but a family has a chance of surviving. And let's assume this family is smart, they survived, they're in a region where, where they were not attacked or killed and they were able to grow some crops, okay, they're going to live on subsistence farming. And, you know, they, they won't have uh, too many things at, the, at their disposal, okay, they're probably not going to have any oil anymore, any gas, someone made by someone, okay, so they won't be able to run tractors or anything like that, there won't be any animals uh, to plow, so they're going to have to do it by hand, like the old-fashioned way, right, and that's if they survive, and there can't be anyone near them, because these pockets are going to be very, very isolated, that means if they reproduce, they're going to reproduce locally, and let's say 10 people survive of a, one family, uh, let's say four of them are young, or five, and out of those young people, okay, so they produce a couple children. How long do you think it would take for them to lose their genetic diversity completely 
and end up in extinction anyways. I mean, you know, what people don't understand is that we have lost our genetic diversity. And, and that's very hard for people to accept. They say, what do you mean? And here, I'll give you an example. Okay, this is a prime example. And, uh, and this is from Oxford University, a study that they made. They went to Africa and they checked three different uh, tribes or uh, they're called troops of uh, chimpanzees. And this was the conclusion that came out of that. So even though all the chimpanzees live in relatively close proximity, chimpanzees from different populations were substantially more different genetically than humans living on different continents. That is, despite the fact that the habitats of the two groups are separated only by a river, it speaks to the great genetic similarities between human populations. You know, you have a, a troop of chimps maybe 50 to 100 chimps, they have more genetic diversity than all of the 8 billion people on Earth. And the reason for that is very simple. We've, we're an old species. We're an old species. We've been inbreeding for perhaps 200,000 years, if that's the date you want to accept for the start of the human race. And so we've been inbreeding for a long time. And a species, as I explain in my book, uh, How the Neanderthals Disappeared, at beginning, it gains genetic diversity as uh, the groups of people occupy different niches and uh, get accustomed to different environments. But after a while, they start coming down and we lose genetic diversity. And we can only lose genetic diversity because of population bottlenecks followed by founders effects and that series of population bottlenecks followed by founders effects what it does is streamlines our genetic code and uh, yeah uh, what what does it is disease disease makes us all be the same the reason Japanese has the same genetic code as you do has nothing to do with his grandfather marrying someone in your family it's got to do with the fact that we all went through the same uh, sifting process. We all conquered the same kinds of diseases. Our ancestors did. And today we're all the same. We're all clones. Marry whom you marry, he's your brother or she's your sister. Genetically. That's how, how clony we are. <laughs> okay? So, no, uh, we're not going to restart the population if, if we have a crash. Uh, the people who survive will just live out their lives and that's it. Besides the psychological effect of having no one on planet Earth, just imagine that. Just do it on your own, right? Think about it. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, here's uh, another comment that was made. Uh, and it says uh, that they quoted this person saying, historically fertility has been falling across Europe. If we took if we look at the, the most recent period, the last 10 years or so, we see rises in fertility in most advanced countries. Well, I don't know uh, who this professor is, but she's got it wrong. She's got it wrong because uh, uh, the population uh, pyramid is overturning no matter what we do on planet Earth. And here, here I showed, and this is the, this is the true rate, uh, growth rate for population on Earth. Uh, by mid-century, we're going to reach ZPG, zero population growth. We're going to have babies, but, uh, you know, we're, we're, the population is not going to grow because we're going to have very few babies and lots of deaths. Okay, that's one issue. And then um, I show the population curve for any species. And I'm saying this is my population curve. You can challenge it if you want, but essentially what I'm saying is that when a species starts out, it has this very... Uh, young pyramid, which is very few young people, and lo I'm sorry, lots of young people and very few old people, and births are up and deaths are up. They're both high. You know, they just spit out kids, and they everybody dies very young. And then as uh, time goes by, you know, eventually that shifts over and we start having, uh, we go from no, nomads to, uh, uh, to a sedentary type of life. We settle down, we colonize, like we did in the 16th century, essentially, we colonized the planet and shortly after there as well. And today we're, we've colonized the entire planet. 
Okay, uh, now the only uh, place we can go is outside of the earth, <laughs> and that's not going to happen for sure. Uh, but uh, then what happens at that point, once we settle down, is births go up and dust goes down because we get used to the endemic diseases. Okay, and, then, and uh, today we don't die of contagious diseases anymore, but that used to be the norm 200 years ago. And then at some point, we even out where births and deaths uh, more or less uh, become the, the, the same. And that's when we get ZPG, zero population growth. And eventually, births go down drastically and deaths go up. And that's the end of the human race. Okay, that's my um, chart for humans. But that applies to any species. I think that's what happens when uh, species settle down and become sedentary. Okay. And again, uh, you don't have to agree. I'm not asking you to agree, I'm asking you to understand what I'm proposing. You can do your own research and find out if any of that uh, clicks with you. Okay, okay and here's uh, also a comment along the lines that of repopulating the earth. But I like the first comment this person made, can we live without trade? Based on current econ uh, economy, the only answer to that question is no. Okay, I like that answer. But then he says, but if trade stops tomorrow, this will not lead to extinction. <laughs> So he's got a yes there. Uh, so <laughs> people live with these contradictions. They don't even realize it. But yeah, again, uh, talking about repopulating the earth. Uh, never going to happen. Okay. Um, another person, I think the same person, uh, put something about the conifers. Good comment. And says, conifers conform to your criteria of an old species. Yeah, correct. Conifers still survive. Yeah, correct. 10% still survive today. Okay. Why did conifers survive but dinosaurs did not? Surely at least some dinosaurs would have survived. And uh, yeah, all, all uh, conifers did not disappear. Some did disappear. Some of the ones I think uh, Triceratops and some of the ankylosaurs and some of these dinosaurs ate these uh, herbivores in the uh, 65, 66, 67 million years ago, uh, they, they, I think they ate special types of cycads. They probably ate um, um, cycadioids, Williamsonias, uh, types of plants that did disappear and they're no longer around. And uh, But even though uh, they may have eaten some other type of conifer because the dinosaurs did grow uh, in relation to the conifers, not to angiosperms, okay, they, they, they grew in relation to the gymnosperms, okay, and um, what, you, what you will find is this, um, you know, what I showed last time is that we have the Cretaceous terrestrial revolution and what the angiosperms did, they pushed aside all the conifers. Cycads are conifers, uh, ginkgos are conifers and other gymnosperms. Uh, ferns are not uh, conifers, but they were an older species of plants. And again, all of these got squashed out and uh, evicted by the angiosperms. Okay, that's the first uh, thing I want to show. The second one is this, that um, this, this is the map of where they found some of the last dinosaurs. Uh, especially the T-Rexes, and this, that's just a sample. Uh, we have Sioux, which was picked up uh, in that region in South Dakota, north of South Dakota, and she was the biggest one until Scotty came around, which was found in Lower Canada there. And the last dinosaurs died really in Hell Creek, in that region. That's where it's considered that they probably made their last stand. And you can see that we have the, what is known as the Cycad National Monument, uh, in that corner of South Dakota. It doesn't exist anymore, okay? And uh, the reason it doesn't exist, uh, the Cycad National Forest was a petrified forest of cycads, okay? And people took so many samples that there was nothing left, and they said, well, so much for the monument, <laughs> for, the, uh, for the museum, for the outdoor museum, okay? So, uh, yeah, all the samples vanished, a lot of them taken by paleontologists themselves. And uh, so the issue here is the following. Um, if you look at the map again, here's, here's the map of what happened or what is believed to have happened. You had the Western Interior Seaway, and you can see where South Dakota is there right at the lower left-hand corner. 
uh, and uh, yeah, the we the western corner there, and um, and what happened to the western interior seaway it dried up over five million years, and left that little lake, uh, or you can call it a river almost, right, going into the ocean. And you can see that the Hell Creek, where maybe the last dinosaurs were, <clears throat> were separated from the Cycad Forest. Now, I'm not saying this is exactly what happened. All I'm saying is you can have a forest somewhere where the animals can't find it for whatever reason. They're geographically or physically isolated from that forest. And um, so it doesn't mean that because there were Cycads that the animals had access to those cycads. Maybe they were somewhere else or they were separated by some river or whatever. And so uh, it doesn't follow that because cycads were still around, uh, the di some dinosaurs would have survived. You know, I, I think uh, uh, you have this implosion of the entire herbivore population, the fewer and fewer cycads there are. And I think this is primarily what they ate. They probably uh, were specialized like uh, we are today also. You know, kids today only eat hamburgers, you know, or fast food. They love that. You tell them you're going to take them to Kentucky Fried Chicken or to uh, McDonald's, and boy, they'll be up front, and they want to go. But you say, look, you got to eat your soup, and they say, mm, I don't think I like that. So we're picky eaters, and I think the, uh, a lot of the herbivores towards the end become picky eaters as well. Maybe they just ate the cones instead of eating the uh, plants, you know. I mean, all these details are things that need to be uh, theorized about. Uh, I'm not even sure you can find any evidence of that for sure. You're going to find evidence of everything out there. <clears throat> okay, so... Um, where does this take us? Well, the other day I covered uh, this situation where we had uh, this uh, planet known as Omnitrade. And uh, again, what I suggested is the same thing that I'm, I was just saying about the dinosaur. Maybe they were isolated from their food. And so what was the issue with the Omnitraders? Well, it was that uh, suddenly there was a uh, volcanic eruption and the ocean disappeared. And in its stead, we had these tall mountains. Okay, they were separated from their food. One person put a comment in there saying, <laughs> I love this one. Uh, he said, um, he said, solution to your omnitrade problem. Um, a physical barrier mountain prevents ships from enabling trade between farmers and city folk solution. City folk invent a plane or a rocket. Uh, city folk invent a boring machine. <laughs> I, I can't believe some of these people. They're not even in the context. They're not even in the ballpark. Why didn't I think of that? Of course I thought of that. That's why I made the mountains all the way to the moon so that they couldn't go over it. They, you know, they didn't invent airplanes. Is that a good answer? Uh, they, they had no boring machine or whatever. Let me give you another example. Uh, you know, five um, uh, free wheelies, uh, these narco caps, people who know everything about um, econ economics, you know, they're on a ship, and the ship sinks, and they survive, and they swim to shore. Of course, uh, before they leave the ship and before it sinks, they, they take the treasure chest with them, right? Because that's important to them. And, the, and the, you know, the food that was in the kitchen, that went down to the ocean floor, right? Because they don't think about these things. So they go to shore and they have all this uh, treasure chest. And they have these coins, uh, gold coins and diamonds and all that stuff. And, you know, by, after one hour searching through the island, they realize there's no food on that island. And there's no fish on that island or dolphins or any other animal that swims nearby. They look at a little map that they have and they find that the nearest island is 100 kilometers away, 100 miles away. And that's the only one that's got food. And they can't swim there for sure and they won't make it there even if they did try, uh, you know, especially if they're starving. So the question is, they have trade, but they don't have food to trade for. That's the issue here. And so, so the uh, question we've got is, is not whether <laughs> you find a, an airplane in the island and say, oh, now I can go with the airplane and I have a solution to the food problem. The issue is whether you're physically isolated from food despite that you have trade. Trade does not guarantee food. 
and you need food, you don't need trade. Believe me. We used to live on planet Earth. Most, most of uh, human life was done uh, by hunter-gathering. And they didn't trade. They didn't know what trade was. Uh, some people believe they did trade with the Neanderthals and so on, you know. Again, people who are not on this planet, they don't have their feet on, on, the, on the ground. No, we had no trade until the Neolithic. That's when the trade began. That's when we invented trade. Until then, we had no trade. So we don't need trade, but we needed food, for sure. And we have that situation pretty much today. You know, we are isolated from food. You know, you don't find food in the city, I mean, on the highway, you know, on the streets. Okay, you, you have to go to a supermarket, and someone brings it there because he wants to make a profit, etc., right? The question is, when there is no more money, okay, who's going to bring the mood, food over to, to the supermarket? I mean, uh, you know, the truck driver, if, if, if he doesn't get paid because money is no more, because money has no value, why is he going to bring it for you to keep you healthy, to keep you alive? Is that the incentive? You know, he might keep himself alive by going out there with his truck and getting food wherever he gets it always and say, well, I'm going to live, you know. But as far as the people in the cities, they can starve. He doesn't care about them. He's going to take care of number one. And the same for the corporations. They're not going to produce food if money is no more. Aside from the fact that they have to kick all their employees out because money is no more, they have nothing to pay them with, and the worker is not going to work for nothing, and so on down the line. So money is necessary to keep our economy going. What is our economy today? Trade. Commerce. What is commerce? Commerce is a BS economy. You're not producing anything new. All you're doing is exchanging existing goods or services, right? which again is nothing, there's nothing there. You know, I wave my hand and I get paid. The other person sings, great singer, and gets paid. Okay, and we all just put money around and nothing is left after all that. You might say, well, there's a value in my heart. I, I, I listen to a beautiful song. It's nonsense. There's nothing there. The only thing, we, the only way we can produce more wealth, which is material things, is by using the um, service economy to stimulate agriculture and manufacturing. Okay, So there is a relationship in that sense. But services does not produce wealth directly, only indirectly through manufacturing and through agriculture. Agriculture only when there's more people, because you can't produce more food than necessary, and you can't produce less food than necessary. Uh, agriculture is a, you know, food is a commodity which has to be just right. It's a Goldilocksy uh, commodity. It can't be too much of it and can't be too little of it. You know, Bill Gates doesn't eat 10 times more than I do because he's got 10 times more money. <laughs> right? Okay, so I hope you understand that. And uh, so, yeah, food has to be just right. But if the population grows, then you sell more food, right? And so, in that sense, yeah, food grows in proportion to the population. But, um, but again, uh, you only produce more food if there's more people, and you produce uh, other goods, uh, uh, manufactured goods, uh, again, if there are more people, and if there's demand, but uh, you're producing something, something that remains. When you make a highway, when you make a building, when you produce a machine, you're producing something. When you produce a service, you're producing absolutely nothing. All you're doing is exchanging existing uh, information, whatever. There's nothing there, nothing solid there, okay? People don't understand that, you know, and uh, all these free willies, they don't care. They say, well, it's value. They talk about value. They don't talk about things. They talk about concepts, and they think these concepts are going to keep us alive forever. That's, that's where the worry is, okay? They don't see uh, at least what I see. Anyways, um, continue on here. Um, if we're going to rely on manufacturing, we need to know what an invention is because uh, manufacturing uh, and technology depend on inventions, okay? And so this uh, person uh, accuses me, a couple of them did here, uh, of not defining invention. 
and and they're right. <laughs> I have to hand it to them. You know, I never uh, defined the word invention. I had no definition. I had only intuition of what an invention is, and that's why I say that there have been no inventions since about 1980s when we invented the uh, computer. In other words, when we had a working computer. And since then, there's been no inventions. All we had is modifications to devices that carry their computers, television, radio, uh, telephone. All we did is just play around with these things and put them into different ways. And one of them is the cell phone, which is uh, all in one. Is the cell phone an invention? Absolutely not. It's not an invention because the phone was invented, the computer had already been invented, the uh, radio and television, all those have been invented. So the cell phone is just putting them all together. There's no new invention. It's just a development or what I call an innovation. Okay, and I'll get to that in a second. But here's this comment says, for someone who is very particular about definitions, I think you are oversimplifying the definition to suit your argument. Good, good slap in the face. Good, I love that. <laughs> and he says, an invention, he uses the Wikipedia definitions, as an invention is a unique or novel device, method, composition, or process. The invention process is a process within an overall engineering and product development process. It may be an improvement upon a machine or product or a new process for creating an object or a result. Okay? Another person says, according to Bill's definition of invention, <laughs> there can never be any new inventions because everything that the invention is made of already existed before. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying, okay? I'm saying we cannot invent anything new, okay? And we have not invented anything new. But again, I did not give you a definition of invention, so the slap in the face, I deserved it, okay? Granted, okay? Touché. Okay, uh, one of these fellows uh, puts a, um, a list uh, of things that he thinks are inventions over the last 30 years include portable GPS, internet, social media, Wi-Fi, automated genome sequencer, sequencer, large hadron collider, laser eye surgery, advanced robotics, self-driving cars, drones, digital photography, LED lighting, uh, protease inhibitors to treat HIV, artificial intelligence, etc., etc. Okay, and all those meet the definition of the Wikipedia. Well, I say not one of those is an invention. Okay, and here's my uh, counter argument to that. Okay, uh, see if I can go over. Let's put it over here on the side so that you can match them up. Okay. Self-driving car, the car was already invented. Portable GPS, we had watches since the 17th century. Internet, social media, Wi-Fi, they're not inventions because they are not standalone objects. Okay, We're talking about concepts there, not objects. Okay. Surgery, already invented by Galen, 200 BC. Uh, HIV inhibitors, medicines, potions, poisons, all kinds of stuff that we put in our system. They've been around since the Neolithic again. You know, you heard of the witch doctors. They gave you all kinds of potions, okay? Photography already invented by Nisifor Niepce in 1826, the first guy who came up with a camera. Uh, Large Hadron Collider, well, we've been accelerating particles at least since Geiger, probably even earlier, okay, 1908. Uh, robotics, well, the Greek engineer Stasibius, uh, about 270 BC, applied pneumatics and hydraulics to produce the first organ and water clocks with moving figures, okay? So, you know, uh, and um, the question comes up in whether the working device is, um, is what makes an invention or just a concept. Here you have uh, one concept of the robot, for example, and it was at least invented by the Greeks. They, they knew about robots, so they had the idea uh, because they put that god Hephaestus, you know, he was the uh, blacksmith of the gods in Mount Olympus. He had already built the um, tripods that walked to and from Mount Olympus, and he designed Hermes' winged helmet and sandals. Okay, so, so we've had uh, the notion of invention of, of, um, of a robot. Uh, for a long time, and so the question is, is is the invention coming up with a concept, or is it coming up with a device that you can patent at the patent office? I mean, can I just go to the uh, patent office without a device and say, look, uh, I've got this device that I've got in my mind. Well, I don't think so. I think I have to take something there, okay? 
So I'm just giving you some hints of where I'm leading with this, and it's going to lead to my definition of what a patent is. Okay. So let's uh, let's look at some of the differences between invention and innovation. At least my my notion of them. And again, I use the uh, definitions of the Wikipedia. Okay, and invention is a unique or novel device, method, composition, or process. I'm saying that's not what an invention is. And you can see innovation is a new idea, creative thoughts, new imaginations in form of device or method. In other words, there's no difference between invention and innovation according to the Wikipedia. They apply to objects and concepts. And I'm saying an invention is only an object, not a concept. Okay, we're talking about uh, material things versus abstractions. That's what we're talking about. And um, so here's a contrast okay, that I make between these things. An inventor must patent a device, okay? um, whereas an innovator does not have to patent a process and would rather do everything to keep it secret. And I know a little bit about that because I served three years in prison for it. <laughs> Okay, so in my case was about exactly that point there, okay, the fact that uh, Intercorporation, the uh, person, the, the group that brought me in there, right, into prison, uh, they said I stole their process. And the issue was uh, you can't steal an intangible. You can steal, the, I can steal your shoe and you can't use it, right, and that's why we know that I have stolen it. But copying, hey, everybody copies a song and sings it. Uh, have you stolen the song every time you sing it? Is, is that what we're going to say? And here uh, we have a situation where Intel did not patent their process. They considered it a trade secret, and they tried to control it through confidentiality agreements. And so, again, you say, well, hold it. You didn't patent your process? They're talking about process uh, being part of an invention? They don't uh, patent processes. They don't patent. Pro they want to keep them secret, and they want to protect them. They want protection, despite that they don't publicly disclose them. So it's a way of cheating on trade on um, patent law, okay? and that's what they do. So how can you claim something is yours if you haven't disclosed it to the public through the patent office? If you haven't patented your process. And in fact, it's the other way around. In fact, Coca-Cola has not patented its uh, process for manufacturing Coca-Cola. It allows them to say, if anyone out there says, oh, I, I made Coca-Cola. And Coca-Cola will always say, no, you haven't because you don't know the secret, the secret formula. Okay? And this is the issue. The issue is that no one wants to pro patent processes, partly because you don't want, you know, the Chinese copying those processes and, and doing it over there. So that's part of the reason, you know, a lot of processes remain secret as trade secrets. That's the new wave, okay? Anyways, modification to an existing device is not an invention, but an innovation. And inventions deal with things. Innovations deal with processes and with modifications to inventions. Okay, so we have to distinguish those, those concepts, okay? What is, a, what is an invention? What is an innovation? That's, that's the point I'm trying to make here. And here's a cartoon, I think that puts it in the uh, right uh, context, okay? The guy says, goes to the patent office and he says, you know, he says, uh, I'm afraid this new self you reinvented was, oh, has already been patented. He wants to patent his reinvent itself okay is that a is that a um, is that a uh, patentable thing you would think because the guy came up with an idea okay and this is the issue the issue is whether some things are patentable or not and I'm saying that patents ha uh, deal with inventions and they have to be a physical object they can't be um, a process but then we're talking about the question is, you know, can you, can you, if you made a green table instead of a brown table, uh, are you going to patent the green table and say, oh, I have a new invention, it's the green table. Is that a, is that a new invention? The fact that you painted it green instead of brown? So, so this is the point that I'm trying to make. The fa uh, right now, in this day and age, all we're doing is putting green tables instead of brown tables. That's all we're doing today. We've, we've already got the invention, especially of the things that we absolutely needed. 
And uh, right now we don't, you know, we're patenting these things um, uh, to make money, but not because they are original devices in any way. Okay, that's that's the point that I'm trying to make. Okay, so uh, here's uh, again, you know, the fact that trade secrets are innovations and not uh, not inventions okay and uh, processes nobody wants to patent them but the main point here is that we have a problem with the scientific definitions no one in the last 10,000 years in science in what we call science has learned how to define words scientifically that's I think the big problem that's that's my take on it okay no one has learned how to define words scientifically in a way that they can be used consistently rationally and so you ask a biologist, uh, what is life? I mean, biologists study life, right? And they say, well, we don't have a definition. We don't know what life is. You go to the ontologist, what do you mean by exist? Oh, I don't know. I have all these theories. You know, and, and, and you, it's on and on and on. No one de has ever defined the crucial terms of their discipline. You know, paleontologists, what is a mass extinction? Oh, we don't know. We're still trying to find out. You know, and, and so it, it just goes on and on. And so this is the issue. The issue is that we don't have definitions. And so especially of the crucial definitions, the ones that make or break your arguments. What is an object? What do you mean by exist? What is a mass extinction? What do you mean by life? These words are never defined. And they say, well, that's not important. What's important is my theory. Well, I can't understand your theory if, you, if the key word remains undefined. And that's the issue. Okay, anyways, uh, we patent inventions, and inventions should be public. You know, they have like 20 years protection. Different countries have different uh, times. And so you have to patent this device, and it allows you to make money, the, the inventor, you know, allows them to make money for whatever time, 17, 20 years, whatever, whatever every country determines. Processes, no, they remain as trade secrets. More and more of them. Nobody wants to patent processes. That's why that definition from the uh, uh, Wikipedia should be wiped out because uh, you know processes are not uh, are not are, are not being patented. They are patentable, but they're not. No one's patenting them. Everybody wants to keep the process secret. It's the device they want to sell. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, here we have the wiki definition of, of patent. And what this does is put it in the right perspective. It says, what is a patent? What, do, what does the patent office consider patentable? Okay. So the patent must meet relevant pat patentability requirements, such as novelty, usefulness, non-obviousness. Okay. It's got to be something new. Uh, it's got to be useful in some way, you know. And it's got to be non-obvious. And most uh, patent offices in the world, especially the three important ones, Japan, Europe, and uh, United States, they follow these uh, general rules. Okay? These are rules of thumb. And the doctrine prevents the patenting, patenting of fantastic or hypothetical devices such as perpetual motion machines. Okay? And what I did was I added a couple more, which are very... Uh, somewhat popular out there and puts uh, general relativity on the spot and uh, no wrong one Let's see if I can get this one first and uh, it goes like this um, uh, um, this is the Alcubierre drive which I'm showing there what drives to push against space-time you know, uh, should we patent that? Is that a patentable device? Okay, uh, and I'm saying it's it's not. Uh, here's uh, the uh, Alcubierre drive, just in case, and you can see that it pushes against space time. Okay, so if space time is a physical object, then maybe you can make a ship run at the speed of light. That's the that's the point of the warp drive of the warp bubble in which the your rocket would be in. And so the question is whether this is this is a patentable notion as a something that you can patent. And I, I'm sure the patent office would not accept this as a 
patentable device. In contrast, you have this other one, which is the light sail, okay? And this is a device that is working today. It's being pushed by lasers. It's an, or an enormous kite, essentially. It's being pushed by lasers. The idea is that eventually, hopefully, uh, the sun with its, um, what is it, with its, um, uh, the solar wind will push a uh, light sail big enough. You know, imagine something like they say the size of the country of Turkey. So we're talking about an enormous monster that we have to put out there in space, deploy it. Uh, the sun would push it slowly with uh, the, um, uh, what is it, with the uh, solar uh, wind, whatever that is, right? Uh, again, I covered that the, uh, a couple weeks ago. It's only 10 to the minus 13 uh, level of vacuum, which is almost a tour, uh, almost nothing. But with this uh, faint solar wind, they intend to push this light sail at ever faster speeds until it reaches, I think it's the tenth, a tenth of the speed of light. Okay, so they're testing this thing. The uh, light sail. But uh, you could say that the light sail at least is a patentable device, just like you could say a kite is a patentable device. But the Alcubierre uh, drive, warp drive, that's nonsense. Obviously it's nonsense, and, and there you see why they haven't uh, patented it, because you can't, no, no patent office would accept that thing. Okay, so where does this take us? Uh, this is my definition. Okay, I'm saying that an uh, adventure has to be an object, can't be a process, and uh, it has to have unprecedented use, and that's where all inventions fail today because all uh, inventions have precedented use. The, the, you know, what are you going to do with the table? Make it out of um, a rock first. You know, that's what the uh, Neanderthals had, you know, a, a rock as a table. Uh, then we made it of wood, and then of metal, and then we colored it different colors. Were those inventions? No, a table's a table's a table. So it's not any, uh, nothing new. And um, can be made or used in some kind of industry, that's another issue. You know, I mean, uh, one thing that I consider at least for, uh, for inventions is, does it put people to work? I mean, if it just makes one guy rich, Pet rock, for example, you know, I don't think it's an invention, but this guy put a rock in, inside a uh, enclosure and sold it and made money. Did he put an industry, did he make an industry, does, did this put millions of people to work? No, it didn't. It just made him rich, if anything. I don't even know if he, he became rich because of it. Okay, so I'm, I'm wondering about that. You know, what effect does it have uh, for, uh, for, the, um, for the economy, for, for putting people to work? I mean, if it's a device, it should put manufacturing and blue-collar workers in business. If it doesn't, then, uh, you know, that goes to the word use. Is, is there any use for this? Because if there's no usage, millions of people using it or demanding this, and you don't put an industry to manufacture it, what was the point of the so-called invention? Was it just because you had an idea and, you, and nobody wants it? That's the point I'm trying to make. And then, and again, uh, I get these notions from what patent offices today think about an invention. And it provides some identifiable benefit. Again, if nobody buys it, then what was the point of the invention? Okay. Innovation, cosmetic modification of an existing device, which is what we're doing today. We're doing a lot of innovation, no invention whatsoever. No way of doing something, process, method, that kind of thing. So I'm saying... That's what, that's what in innovation is. And all we're doing today is just innovating. We're, we're not inventing anything. And so uh, I, I distinguish those two terms for those who, you know, say, why did I say that there are new, no new inventions? Yeah, we have no new true inventions. All we have are innovations. We go to our research and development departments, and they modify an existing device or whatever that they have, and they make it better, more faster, uh, more uh, uses, maybe perhaps, you know. You know, the fact that you made a car with five wheels does not make, uh, is not an invention. A car is a car, a car. And we can't reinvent the car, we can't reinvent the plane, we can't reinvent the wheel, we can't reinvent any of these things. And so, um, uh, well, here are some popular inventions that we've had 
uh, since ancient times, you know, the table, the chair, wheel, bed, uh, maybe some kind of pillow was a rock at one point in time. We made it softer, right? But it's still the pillow, the use we had for it, right? Pots and pans, axe, you know, we didn't invent the axe a year ago. No, the axe has been around for quite a while. Club, you know, the <laughs> banging club, right? Spear, knife, spoon, boat. You know, you make a ship. Yeah, it's a boat. Sorry. It's already been invented. Can't patent it. All you can do is innovate it and whatever you want to call an innovation. Sword, uh, sling, you know, they've been around for quite a while. Um, what is not, uh, here are non-inventions, according to me again, okay? Let's put this over here. Okay, here are the non-inventions. Again, fire is not a physical object. That's why fire does not qualify, according to me, as an invention. Fire is a combustion process. Okay, it's oxidation. A lot of people don't know that. They say, oh, fire, I see something. Yeah, but it's what you're seeing is a combustion, a process. Domestication, was that an invention? We call that an invention. We, we go to the patent office and patent domestication. Skinning an animal, left nipple feeding. I like that one, you know. I mean, a woman invents, you know, feeding, breastfeeding her baby with, with her left nipple. Now, should she go and patent and say, oh, I've invented a new, new way of feeding a baby. I'll do it with my left. Is, is that a patentable device? You know, cesarean, you know, a lot of these uh, medical things, they're not patentable. And uh, there's many reasons for that, okay? You should look that up. Surgical procedures, drugs and potions, you know, a lot of that stuff. Some uh, drugs and potions in general are patentable, but not the surgical procedures, okay? Vaccines, is that patentable? Antibiotics, you know, uh, should, should we consider those uh, as new devices or, or something? These are things you got to think about, okay? Banknote, we invented money at some point in time. Say, oh, I've got a new invention, money. Is that an invention? Does that qualify as one? Language? You know, we invent a new language. A uh, baby does, uh, says, da da goo goo. Oh, he's got a new language. That, I, I, I'm going to patent that. <laughs> okay. Song? Someone has a new song? No, we, we take those to the copyright office, not to the patent office, right? And a lot of these concepts are taken to the Copyright office, uh, uh, trademarks, you know, they're, they're not patentable. Uh, that's a trademark. You know, I invent a word and uh, call it a trademark. Uh, is that patentable? No, that's trademarked. Uh, customer lists, they qualify as a, pa as a patent. Law, you know, uh, legislature invents stuff every day. <laughs> uh, chip process, I know something about that, yeah. Um, you know, the specs, specs specifications. Is that patentable? Again, a process? Well, they don't do that anymore. They, they keep it secret. Okay? Computer program. Is, is, is that a uh, patentable uh, thing? Oh, I'm going to patent my computer program. Well, a lot of these things are considered patentable by the patent office. I do not consider them patents. Um, uh, I do not consider them inventions. Okay? But what's the bottom line as far as I'm concerned? Uh, Let's assume we, we, um, we invent something, something new. I don't know, uh, uh, going through the fourth dimension, um, what, uh, uh, should we consider that a, uh, a, uh, an invention? You know, I make a device uh, that takes us uh, back in time, for example, okay? Let me put this here. Uh, you make uh, the time machine, okay? or something that takes you through the fourth dimension or the fifth dimension, I don't care. Is that going to put billions of people to work? That's one of the issues I've got, because if it expands the blue-collar worker force, uh, then you can say, well, this is a pretty good invention because there's demand for this thing, and look at all the factories that are popping up, and they're hiring blue-collar workers everywhere, and they're paying them good money just to come to the factory and build this thing. Will that ever happen ever again on planet Earth? 
And I'm saying, of course it won't. I don't care what you invent. It's not going to put billions of people to work. What we have today is existing companies, for example, electronics companies, which are building some of these things. Um, uh, you know, they buy out someone, they, they might buy out an idea or whatever, and they implement it. So, so no new company comes into being and says, oh, now I'm going to hire a billion workers because I need to produce all these widgets. No such monster. Agri uh, uh, agriculture and manufacturing are dying. Uh, uh, here, here's the uh, little uh, graph. Okay. And you can see what's happening with manufacturing. And, and also with agriculture. Agriculture is becoming a smaller and smaller percentage of GDP of gross domestic pro, uh, product. And, um, and manufacturing is also going in the same direction, at least for high income and, uh, and uh, at least for high income countries. And I think it's also going for middle income countries as well. Uh, it's gonna eventually die out. We're gonna have less and less manufacturing, not only as a percentage of D GDP, but also as a percentage of labor. Fewer and fewer people are gonna be working in manufacturing. And agriculture is almost dying. It's, uh, it's got almost nothing. It's like 1% of GDP and very few people working it because we do a lot of that with automation. We're so efficient at producing food and at distributing it that, you know, that we don't really need uh, people. And even if we produce uh, manufacturing in some way, uh, one of the problems will be that we will probably make it with robots or some kind of automated uh, system. So we won't need humans anyways to, to produce whatever manufacturing uh, device you invented. So even if, like some say, the technological singularity where inventions will just explode because the robots are going to be doing the inventing for us, they're smarter than us, these people are, are dreaming. These people, are, uh, they don't have their feet on the ground anymore. These people are absolutely dreamers. They've been watching too much Hollywood movies. We're not going back to manufacturing. Manufacturing is dying, and uh, hopefully I can illustrate it here. Okay. That's what we have. We have uh, hunter gathering is dead, been buried a long time ago. Agriculture is on life support. And what happens the day that manufacturing dies? The blue collar worker there, right? Uh, well, all we'll have left is services. And what is services? Well, services doesn't produce wealth. What services does is simply exchange existing things, okay, primarily. I mean, uh, we also do service for service. But we're not creating anything new. We're not creating new highways, new buildings, new wealth, measurable wealth. All we're doing is exchanging abstractions. And the freewheelers, they don't understand that. They, they think there's nothing wrong with that. They, they say, well, so what? You know, we have value. They talk about value. They don't talk about things. They talk about value because that's important to them. What can I say? Uh, <laughs> I think these people are dreamers. They don't realize what's happening. Uh, and what's happening is we lost our ability to, to uh, keep our economy running. I think what's going to happen is as more and more agriculture dies and more manufacturing dies, uh, we have less wealth on the planet. And that means that all we will be doing for the next billion years, maybe trillion years, we're just going to be exchanging existing goods or goods that we replaced, but there's going to be no increase in goods because manufacturing is going down, population is not increasing. I mean, uh, am I the only guy seeing these things out there? Uh, I don't know. Uh, that's what I see. Okay. Anyways, that's all I can give you. I'll give you my peace of mind. I'll give it to you as honestly as I see it. Uh, free wheelers, wheelers, free willies, <laughs> free wheelers, <laughs> uh, free willies and uh, narco caps, they disagree with me completely. They say, no, no, we, we've got it covered. We're, we're going to be trading for the rest of humanity. And uh, I cannot imagine, especially the uh, people who want to get government off their backs and who say that corporations are too big and it'd be nice if we chop them up and have competition again. What's not going to happen? Uh, what we're having is, if, if anything, we have collusion among car companies and uh, defense companies and so on. You know, they're, they're all in the same boards, right? 
they, they all uh, have the same people on the same boards. They meet every now and then. They play golf together and they reach decisions. They have this collusion out there. If anything, there's mergers. There's not uh, a breakup of companies to create competition. And so uh, we, we have big monsters out there. And the day those monsters die, for whatever reason, we're going to have a big problem. It's not going to be taken over by individual entrepreneurs that go in there and say, oh, there's no food. Oh, I think I'm going to produce, I'm going to plant potatoes because they're $1,000 a pop because people are starving. And what are you going to do? Wait four or five months until the potato grows? Is, is that what you're going to do? To sell it at a thousand bucks to whom? Who's going to pay you a thousand bucks and for what? So again, all these people are dreamers. They're dreamers as far as I'm concerned. These people don't have their feet on the ground anymore. They don't even know what they're talking about. That's my take on it. You can throw tomatoes, rotten eggs, but you'll have to do them, what is it, on uh, uh, Wednesday? next time around okay so we'll see you then and i'm gonna go back to ayn Rand. one last episode i left something behind when i digressed on extinction coming back finishing that off and then we go back into physics and thanks again to all the supporters for this year and i hope you, all of you have a uh, happy new year don't drink too much don't don't drink and drive like i do <laughs> we'll see you then bye bye <laughs>